Good morning, TCG fans, and welcome to Season 2 of Pack and Review. And we're going to begin the second season with perhaps the most fitting pack to review, and one that I'm sure many of you are still very intrigued by, the newest set, Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelist Alliance. So it's been a while since we've uh, chatted, as far as pack and review is concerned. Uh, and the first season was a bit of a mismatch because we had so many different things going on as far as the rating scale changing mid-season and all those things. Um, and so we're hoping to, now that we've got everything formatted, now that we've got the border on the video, we've got everything clean and everything looks good. So going forward, everything should stay very similar. So we do episodes every Monday uh, until the season is finished. Although next week's episode will be on Wednesday instead. Uh, that's just a one-time thing because of something else that we have scheduled. Um, so basically we're going to do things differently. For those of you who are not familiar with Pack and Review, go ahead and check out the annotation here or the link in the description below. You can watch the first season and get an idea of what some of those packs were uh, and how the entire thing works. Um, we're also going to be doing a video at one point during the season. It'll be like one of the episodes where we update every pack that we reviewed from the first season with the new score card, which you can see right here. So this score card grades on five things. That would be balance, current status in the metagame, historical significance, support, which is uh, in the sense of what does it offer to different archetypes and things like that, and value, because of course Yu-Gi-Oh! is one of those games that is a money game and many people like to profit, uh, myself included I suppose, I don't play anymore, um, but we'll add all those up, those are all out of 10, and then we'll grade them for a final score of 50, so this gives some packs a much better chance to kind of redeem themselves uh, and get a grade, and at the same time packs that may be really good will reflect that way instead of the just the out of five scale that I was doing which is way too specific as far as I'm concerned so we're gonna begin and I'm gonna kind of just talk throughout this here and you can read the captions in the border as well that'll tell you just kind of what some things are um, simply because uh, I'm not gonna try to I don't want to make too cluttered on screen you know so we're gonna start with balance we're gonna talk about the balance of some things in this set now I guess the most important thing to talk about here would be shadows uh, they just came out uh, this is the first set they were introduced to the game. There's multiple different ones. There's the L Shadows, which are fusion monsters, and I believe we got two in this set. That would be Winda. Uh, previously, oh, I can't remember the name now. Ah, oh, of course, it's off the top of my head. Uh, Winda's very well known. Its name, I don't like the name change at all. And of course, I can't remember right off the top of my head what it was. And um, there's also Construct, which used to be Nephilim. Uh, those are the two here. Um, they're both interesting cards, uh, but they of course fit with the rest of the theme of Shadows, in which they all trigger when they're sent to the graveyard by card effects, and there's basically just some really powerful cards mixed into that archetype that makes use of those effects while allowing you to plus and not have to worry too much about any of your plays. So, oh, Midrash, that's what it was. Uh, Winda is what used to be Midrash in the, in the Japanese version. Makes sense now. So, Shadows basically have a fusion for every uh, attribute. Um, but there's only two here so far, which means cards like Super Poly are really good, and then it triggers their effects as well, and they don't miss timing. So there's a giant, you know, kind of block that goes around that, that these things are able to make use of. So that's why they're so powerful. Um, as far as some other cards in here, this Odd Eyes Pendulum Dragon, which is a cool card, and I, I'd like to think it's balanced, so I'm definitely seeing some combos with Big Eye and Draco Sack and some other rank 7s that make it abusable. Um, that'll really be something that time will tell. Uh, the Yang Zing monsters introduce the Worm archetype, which uh, basically they all revolve around special summoning one another. They're floaters that can synchro during the opponent's turn. So there's a lot of cards that they combo well with, such as um, their Fusion monster. Uh, not Fusion, I'm sorry, I can't even think. Their Synchro monster, rather, which is a secret rare, and that um, is... You'll see it pop up. It's Yang Zing. It's something of the Yang Zing, and I'm a little slow with this today because I'm still trying to get myself familiarized with this set, so I'm looking over my notes here, and I'm like, oh, what the heck is that? But regardless, the Synchro Monster basically functions as a sort of Metal Tiramisu, uh, can shuffle stuff back into the deck and do some pretty interesting combos. So that's Baxia Brightness of the Yang Zing. Uh, I don't remember what its Japanese name was, but there's actually a bunch of different cards in this set that have those convoluted names, which is interesting enough. But Yang Zing monsters do appear to have a lot of interesting support, including Yang Zing Path, which is a pot of Avarice for the set, uh, as well as some other trap support that they have that basically allows them to function effectively as floaters. 
Um, other cards to look at as far as balance are concerned would be the Stellar Knight Monsters, which is really like someone at Konami just sat down and said, hey, let's create the most generic archetype possible with the most powerful effects, and that's what you got. There's their Stellar Knight Deltharos, which is the ghost rare in the set, as well as an ultimate rare and a secret rare, is a really, really good generic rank 4. Um, and then there's other just really just a bunch of cards. They have a counter trap that can stop all sorts of plays, and then they have a Stratos, and they have a monster that special summons from the graveyard. There, There's a lot of issues with Stella Nice as far as I'm concerned in terms of card design. Um, but I mean, overall balance, it's not too bad. We also get Felice Lightsworn Archer, which is the last card Lightsworn needed after the Realm of Light structure deck came out, which I believe happened while we were on our vacation. Um, there's Castell, the Sky Blaster Musketeer, which is a really good generic rank 4 that kind of is almost better than Shark Knight, uh, number 101, for those of you who aren't sure. Um, and then, of course, there's some more Shadow cards, and there's some Scattered Pendulum Monsters that go throughout this as well. Um, as far as the overall grade goes, I'm going to go ahead and give it a... 6 out of 10 for balance, taking into account that a lot of the cards do introduce some cool archetypes and that they are balanced and relatively fun to play, but cards like Shadows offer some unfair advantages to players, and that's definitely something that's worth considering. So we'll go with 6 out of 10 for balance, simply because I think it's got a decent balance to the point where most of the cards are fair, but there are some that might be worth a second look as far as, you know, was this the best design? Um, the second category, which would be current, uh, is actually the easiest to create, and I'm going to go ahead and give it a 9 out of 10 immediately, and then I'm going to explain my reasoning why. Um, honestly, so many archetypes in this set see play right now. Uh, Shadows are considered a tier 1 deck. Um, Stellar Knights, if they are not there already, definitely have the potential to get there soon. Burning Abyss is already being talked about as a deck that's going to see a lot of play in the metagame, and there are, there's a lot of emphasis around it due to its combos with tour guides and things like that. And scattered cards like Yang Zing, which have already been doing a lot in Japan, are expected to do a lot here. So there's not too much to go into with this to say that this set, although it is the first set of the Arc 5 era, really just introduces a bunch of new archetypes that are going to see play right off the bat, and then secret rares and exclusives and stuff that either support those archetypes or go into business for themselves as far as um, making other cards or other decks prevalent. So it's really just simple there. Um, but as easy as it was to give the set a current, um, we're going to have the same issue with history because it's brand new. There is nothing we can give it historically yet. So for history, we're going to not include this category. So right now, for this set particularly, we're going to grade it based on those four scales, and we're going to kind of scale it down so that it doesn't negatively affect, but it doesn't benefit from it either. Uh, in the future, we can take a look back at the set and take a look at things historically and see if maybe there were some things that uh, we should have considered, things that we didn't consider, things like that. So history is a non-existent category right now. We're going to give it an NA out of 10, just so that we're completely fair when it comes to grading this. The fourth category would be support, which is based on archetypes, and this set definitely excels in that. It introduces uh, Shadows, which are obviously first time in this set, but they get some awesome support, and as an archetype, they are very strong. Um, Stellar Knights, which again, I don't particularly care for as card design, but there's no arguing that they function cohesively as an archetype, and they have a lot of positive ways to plus off one another. Um, you also have Burning Abyss, which is a new archetype introduced in here, which has some pretty cool cards in it. Um, obviously Yang Zing as well. Uh, there's Pendulum cards that don't necessarily go with any specific archetypes, but they do make cards from those archetypes more playable, um, at least if you're putting together combos that do use that. Um, uh, normal monsters, although I don't think you can count them as an archetype, do get a lot of interesting support in here as well, which is kind of cool um, from Pendulums and some other cards like. Uh, but it really hits strong with archetypes as far as being a support category goes, and like if you want to build a deck that's not some kind of Highlander deck and that actually focuses well on being able to support archetypes both new and past, this deck does it really well. Uh, Lightsworns obviously get the support of Felice, which is a really cool card, um, and Shadows and Lightsworns can combo together. There's a lot of interesting decks, whether it's hybrids or straight-up decks, that are created as a result of this. So I'm going to go ahead and give it an, a solid 8 out of 10 for support. And finally, our final category as far as the grading system goes would be value. Now, I've taken a quick look, uh, not even a quick look, actually. I've studied these prices for a while, starting with what's the highest and what's the lowest. And there is no card currently in the set that goes higher than $35. But as expected, many of the high rarity Shadow cards have a very high value. Uh, both Construct and Nephilim, in their highest rarity forms, are worth a good amount. Uh, Dante, Traveler of the Burning Abyss, which is a TCG exclusive that combos well with Tour Guide and the other Burning Abyss cards, is also 30 bucks. Odd Eyes Pendulum Dragon is high. Stellar Knight Deltharos is high. Um, Time Space Trap Hole, 
And that's another cool thing I should mention too. A lot of the secret rares, almost every single one in this set, command some kind of value, with the exception of Magical Spring, which I think has potential, so in the future perhaps it'll be better. Um, you also have Sinister Shadow Games, Shadow Fusion, Odd Eyes Pendulum Dragon as an ultimate, um, and I believe Stellar Knight Deleb or Deteb, I can't pronounce the name. Um, Deneb, rather, I was close. Uh, they're all floating around 20. Uh, they're, those are ultras and supers, which means that as far as pulling things out of this pack goes, it, maybe just because it's new and once the initial release kind of settles, things will drop further. Um, taking that into consideration and taking into consideration the fact that there are some cards, almost two pages worth of cards here, that are $15 or higher, I'm going to go ahead and give it a 7 out of 10 for price. Um, that could either fluctuate higher or lower in the future, but because we're looking at this now as it is, I feel like those are probably the best things to take into consideration. Consideration. So starting from the beginning of the scorecard, we have a 6 for balance, we have a 9 out of 10 for current, we're not grading history, we have an 8 out of 10 for support, and we have a 7 out of 10 for value. So you add those two together, you're going to get a 30 out of 40, which is really not a bad number at all. Uh, when you divide 30 by 40, which is obviously the most effective way to figure out this, uh, this little formula here, you get a percentage of 75%. Now, this scale is much more reasonable for that reason, like I talked about. Um, if we had included history, I mean, just to say maybe the set had some kind of historical significance in a different set, let's say, and we were to just go, you know, I don't know, 38 out of 50, and this number is irrelevant, and I'm just trying to show the usefulness of the scale, that would give it a 76% as well. Now, this is obviously much higher than the averages that sets in the previous series uh, season got, rather, and it's a much more effective scale to use. However, for the final grade for this, we're going to give it a 75%. That's a C plus or a C, depending on your value scale, and it's really good, honestly, when you consider that it's a new set, that people may like it or dislike it, but it's a pretty solid foundation to start on, and it makes me optimistic about what some other sets are going to be using this new scale. So like I said, in another video that will come at some point during this season, we're going to update all of those previous packs in one video, kind of quickly go through, touch on points, and give them all updated grades to see how well they really are uh, on a more reasonable scale. So you can see the scorecard here. Uh, you can see that we're giving it a grade of 75, which is a C plus. So that's pretty cool. We got everything um, good as it should be here. And so we're going to open some Duelist Alliance packs. So this is the first time I've opened any Duelist Alliance packs at all. I did not attend a sneak preview. Uh, I did not buy any packs other than today. Now, today I'm actually filming this on a Friday, uh, which is the day the set came out. So unless you went to a place maybe like Walmart, which might have had it out earlier, there was really no way to get access to these sets earlier unless you're, you know, not obeying Konami law. But I've got three packs of Duelist Alliance here. And I know one of the things people mentioned about the previous season uh, was that packs, you know, we only opened one pack at a time and people didn't really get much of a to see anything, so I've increased that number here. So let's go ahead and dive right in as far as this is concerned and see what we got. We've got Super Heavy Samurai Swordsman, Stellar Knight Vega. If this card is summoned, you can special summon one Stellar Knight monster from your hand, except Stellar Knight Vega. Fishborg Doctor. Maybe he'll bring the Fishborg Launcher back someday, you never know. Or Blaster, rather, I'm sorry. Gaia the Midnight Sun. Uh, this is kind of cool. Um... Rare is a Skarm Malin Branch of the Burning Abyss, which is one of those new cards that combos well with Tour Guide. Um, I'm not even familiar with what it does, to be honest with you, but it seems cool nonetheless. Uh, and our... No, we do not have a foil yet. This is Spy C Spy. This card is normal. So I'm going to look at one random card in your opponent's extra deck. If it has 2,000 or more attack, this card gains 1,000 attack. If it has less than 2,000 attack, you gain life points equal to its attack. That's a neat card. The Agent of Entropy, Uranus. Stellar Nova Wave, which is an ultimate offering for Stellar Knights. And Battle Guard King. So, that's pretty cool so far. I'd be happy to get one foil uh, out of these packs here, but we'll see what happens. You never know. We could get something awesome. Let's see. We got Ultimate Ultra Athlete Stadium. White Prince. It's another Skull Servant support. Artifact Chakram, Performapal Skeeter Skimmer, uh, I can't pronounce that, but I believe those used to be Entermits, Seer Malabranch of the Burning Abyss, that's really cool actually, I like the design on those quite a bit, uh, they look like something straight out of Magic the Gathering, I know they're based on Dante's Inferno as well, um, Stellar Knight Alpha, Hippo Carnival, Chain Dispel, and Super Heavy Samurai Blue Brawler. And for the final pack in this pack-in review, 
And it's just cool to be back and doing this and really getting things going again. So I'm kind of excited and optimistic at the same time. And we will see what we can do. If we could get one foil, it would be awesome. So, Artifact Chakram, Performer Pal Skeeter Skimmer, Deskbot 001, Battleguard Howling, Shadow Dragon, that's awesome. And a ultra, whoa, that's cool. An ultra rare Feliz Light Sworn Archer. What a cool card. That's awesome. That's an OCG exclusive as well that we're just getting here. We'll take a look at that again in a second. Stellar Knight Alpha, Performer Pal Swordfish, and Hippo Cullen. So, that's really cool. I was not expecting that. I was just expecting maybe a foil at best. But that's the best pull we've gotten on, on the show so far. Uh, we got these three rares. Shadow Dragon. Malabranch of the Burning Abyss, and Skarm, and of course Feliz Lightsworn Archer, which reads, cannot be normal summoned or set, must be special summoned by a card effect, and cannot be special summoned by other ways. If this card is sent from the deck to the graveyard by a monster effect, special summon it, you can tribute this card, then target one monster your opponent controls, destroy that target, and if you do, send the top three cards to your deck to the graveyard. And it's a tuner, so that's really cool. That's an awesome ultra rare. So, so this is the new format going forward for pack and review. If anyone does have any criticisms or critiques or things they might like to see done differently, be sure to let me know. And on behalf of all of us here at Love Shack TCG, I'd like to thank you guys for watching and check back next Wednesday, the 27th, for a brand new episode of pack and review.